Good morning, Crosswind. How is everybody doing? It's good to see everybody here on this beautiful morning. My name is Mandy, and I'm an owner here at Crosswind, and I just want to welcome you all to church. Um, it's so pretty outside. I'm so excited about that. It's finally starting to feel like spring. Um, yes. I'd also like to welcome all of the folks that are watching online. We're glad that you're with us. If this is your first time, we're super excited that you're here. We really want to welcome you, and we hope that when you came in, you stop by the Welcome Center on the way in. If you did not, please stop by the Welcome Center on your way out because we want to know that you are here, and we also have a We're Glad You're Here gift that we would like to give you. Um, for our first-time guests, I do want to let you guys know we have a wonderful center right back here, Crosswind Kids, where you can take uh, children from birth all the way up to fifth grade, where we have volunteers back there who want to talk to your kids about Jesus on a level that they can understand. So feel free to take the kids back there, um, and they can have their own worship, which is wonderful. Um, also, we have a mom room, which is right back here. If you would like to keep your baby close to you in the auditorium, or if you just need a little privacy, right back there in the mom room, you can watch everything that's going on out here and have some privacy. So that's a great little space for, for moms. We also have a starting point room back here. So if right after the service, if you want to talk to somebody, if you need to pray with somebody, if you just have questions about Crosswind, there'll be people back there right after the service to talk to you. Um, we also have a couple different ways to give. If you are an owner here at Crosswind, um, you can give your tithes and offerings in the boxes that are on the wall. You can also give on the website and on our app. A couple of announcements. Water baptisms are coming up Sunday, March 27th. Um, so you can begin to sign up for that on the app. Um, there's also new Crosswind t-shirts available that are on the app. And we've gotten ours, and they're really cool. They say life with Jesus is better. Um, and a portion of the proceeds for that go towards our mission trip to Honduras. And then also feel free to wear that on Easter Sunday, where we do kind of forget the frock, where we buy a t-shirt instead of an expensive Easter outfit. And the money for the t-shirt goes towards a really good cause, our mission trip. Um, I think that's it, guys, right? I feel like there was something else. No, that's it. We're glad that you guys are here, and you guys are welcome to stand and sing with us. everybody. How are we doing? God's got great things for us. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me
coming with a heart of words. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Ah! 
I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me free Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace It won't find me again
your voice You have led me through the fire In the darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God
Thank you for your good love, your faithfulness, your gentleness. Thank you for having compassion. Thank you for having eyes that would see, ears that would hear. for being willing to save, willing to die on a cross, willing to raise up from the dead. We're so thankful, so grateful that you've welcomed us into your house today. May we live here for the rest of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Well, hey, everybody. It is good to see all of you guys here in the room. As always, it's great to have those of you who are watching and listening online as well. Uh, special welcome, uh, as always, to those of you who are guests. This is your first time to Crossman Church, or maybe you haven't been here in a while, whatever the case may be. We're so delighted um, to welcome you as well. My name is Garrett, and I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Crossman Church. And for those of you who are new, or for those of you, again, if you haven't been here uh, at least for the month of March, we've been in this series, as you saw from the video, that we've entitled Welcome Redefined. Uh, and a lot of fun over the last couple weeks, right? Like we've seen how like Jesus kind of shows up in uh, the very first century. The gospel writers uh, tell us, especially as we're looking in the gospel of Luke and kind of redefines the way that we, uh, that at least that culture uh, welcome folks. And if you're a Christian, what we've been trying to do is trying to apply this to our very own lives to see how we can uh, redefine the word welcome uh, and hospitality and all that type of mindset as well. So if you were here a couple weeks ago on the, on, on the outset of this series, we talked about um, Jesus welcoming a tax collector, right? Remember that from uh, the beginning part of Luke where Jesus welcomes a tax collector. Not only welcomes him, but like invites him to join him and, and Levi or Matthew, depending on how you, however uh, you want to use whichever name of his. You see where like Jesus like welcomes him in and then not only like him, but his friends. Like Levi throws a big old party, and as tax collectors, the only 
friends you have are other tax collectors. And so uh, Jesus hangs out with like the worst of the worst in, in, society, in that society's eyes. It was the worst of the worst. And, so, and then on the flip side of that, last week we talked about how uh, Jesus not only uh, got into, not involved in, in houses and at homes and around tables with sinners, but also uh, with Pharisees with the religious teachers as well. Last week we got to see where Jesus was inside a religious teacher's house uh, where a sinful woman in the community comes and, and weeps in his presence uh, and she washes his feet, something they would do in that culture. And so what I've loved thus far about this series is that regardless of where you're at in life, Right? Whether you're on the side of you think you're the worst of the worst and you feel rejected and, and maybe a little uh, depressed and feel like you're isolated in whatever kind of way, just like some of these folks that we read about in the Gospels, right? whether they were a tax collector, a prostitute, uh, disabled, poor, whatever their situation was in, if that's kind of like you in a modern day context, like Jesus wants to welcome you. And then on the flip side of that, right, for, for especially we can talk about here in the church today because uh, we're in the church and so most times Christians show up to church and then some other folks too. But like when we talk about Christians and we talk about the church and we talk about the Pharisees, the religious leaders, even those folks Jesus was willing to sit down with, right? And a lot of times when you read the Gospels, you, you almost feel like that Jesus is always trying to, uh, to, to, to uh, I don't know, rebuke them or, or to shame them. But the, the wonderful thing about it, as we're going to look at today in another story, is that Jesus wants to sit down with those who think they're so righteous they don't need God. And for those of us, so let me, let me give you, go ahead and give you a challenge this morning. For those of you who grew up, and this is me, because I grew up in church, and I grew up around church, and in the Bible, and around the Bible, and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes the farther we get away from that place of salvation, that place where grace showed up, and mercy showed up, and compassion showed up, the farther we get from that place, oftentimes we don't dish out what we once received. And so for the Christians here this morning, we might be challenged, we might be inspired, you might even be a little encouraged this morning that even you need to be reminded of that place of salvation, that place of grace, that place of mercy, and that same place of compassion that you once received. So we're going to go to Luke chapter uh, 14. We're going to start out in the very first part of this chapter. Uh, Luke records that Jesus once again is in uh, a, a house of a Pharisee, a very prominent Pharisee. And uh, if, you've, if, you've read the, if you've read this gospel, especially Luke um, talks about where Jesus is, is in somebody's home, right? Um, I'm reading this book about the Last Supper, and this past week I was reading uh, a section of it. And the author pretty much said that if you wanted to kind of summarize the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus, where Jesus spent three, three and a half years on planet Earth in, in, in uh, what we know as like modern day Israel, Palestine, that area. Like, he could, we could summarize it that, that Jesus came eating and drinking. Like, everywhere Jesus went, he was eating and drinking with somebody. He was going to a house, he was going to a home, he was sitting down at a table. And what's amazing, as we've seen through just this series, at least through the Gospel of Luke, like, we're picking out these stories where Jesus is sitting down again with some of society's worst, and some of even the, 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 the elite of the society, or at least in their eyes, the elite or the righteous. And so in Luke chapter 14, uh, we start with verse 1. Luke records this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. And there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. And so taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Now, lots to unpack real quick. Everybody say Sabbath. All right, so we're on the same page. All right, so real quickly, like Sabbath was a big deal in Jewish culture. All right, we don't really get this today, but that's okay. We'll kind of try to explain it a little bit. Like, it was such a huge deal in Jewish culture that from Friday evening, late Friday evening, into uh, a 24 hour period, it was a time of period where you were to do no work. It was a time of period where you were to rest. You were to reflect, you were to uh, worship, you were to think about all the great things that God had done for you in Jewish culture, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, creator God. Like it was a time where you did absolutely nothing. You were to rest and you were to reflect. Now, for those of you super Christians in the room and you've read the Old Testament section of your Bible, and that didn't scare you off, like if you've read the creation story, you know that God created the entire universe and then he rested. 
Not because he was tired, but because he looked at all that he had done. It was great, it was good, and he rested and he enjoyed his work. It's this idea that God gives us an example of work hard, do good things, and then rest and enjoy them. Let me say that again because some of you don't, you don't even get that. Like you work eight days a week, okay? Like there's a time for you to work hard and do great things with your life regardless of what it is and then rest. Look at your neighbor and say rest. In other words, take a nap today. Seriously, someone should have said amen right there. Come on, like take a nap today, right? Like, I mean, there is this incredible example that creator God, this divine being gives us to rest, And then if you were dared to keep reading after Genesis, right, you would see that eventually God comes into a covenant with ancient Israel and he gives them the law, right, which the Pharisees would know very well. And within this law, many of you know that there's like this top ten list. And one of those items on that list, one of those commands that God gives is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And you keep it special, keep it sacred, keep it separate than all the other things that you do. If you're going to work for six days, fine, great, wonderful, but on the Sabbath... Rest, reflect, worship, enjoy the things that you have done. But when you fast forward, so if you go from the time that Moses gets the law, then you fast forward to the very first century, to the time of Jesus. The problem with what had happened through the days and the ages and and the years was that eventually religious people began to adding little rules and regulations and little routines to the law. Bible scholars call this oral traditions, right? And so basically what it was, it was an institution, right? Like, let's just, for the lack of of some fun this morning, let's just pick on the church a little bit, okay? We're all at the church. It's okay. It's all good. But let's pick on the church a little bit. So, like, the church, an institution, a religious institution, they would set up these commands, right? There was the Old Testament. There was the Mosaic Law. And you had these rules. You had these commands. You would follow these things. But eventually there was uh, uh, some things that we just wanted to add to it, right? Like, we're not going to, like, we're not going to make, like, the law 2.0, but like we're just going to kind of add some things that we that maybe God just, he didn't give us the whole details, and so maybe we should just add a little things, right? Like if you grew up in church, around church, like you might have experienced this. Unfortunately, some of you might have left church because of some of these stupid rules, right? I love what Jeremy said last week. He made this little uh, rhyme that said, you know, you shouldn't uh, cuss, drink, or, or, or chew, or go with women that do, right? Like, you know, you've ever heard this before, right? Like, this is just like, it's like a little pick. It's like, it's like one of those little nudges at some of those rules that we, that we kind of make up along the way. Like, there's really no spiritual context for that. There's no really no uh, biblical context for that. But, like, we've just kind of added that along the way as the church has grown, haven't we? We think, oh, this is, this is what we need to teach people. And whether it was a Sunday school teacher or whether it was a pastor from a stage, we began, in, we began pushing little rules, right? Not from the Bible, not from the context in which we should be living, the red words of Christ, the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, John, those folks that give us the idea of Christian living. But we've just kind of added a few little things. This is exactly what Jesus is getting at with the Pharisees. Is along the way they've kind of added some rules and they want to do things, just a, just a little nitpick, little things to add to the law. And so eventually, when you get to this point where there's a, there's a disabled man, there's a healing, that needs to, there's a man of suffering in front of Jesus. He's being watched carefully. Jesus knows her soul. He's being fully God, fully man. And he asks the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? This great, sacred, holy day that we should rest? Should we... Should we focus on the rules and forget that compassion and mercy and grace is needed right here in front of me? Could it be that through the ages that when the law was given, could it be that some folks, Pharisees, religious leaders of the day, begin to focus more on the rules than of the people? I think it would be a sad day for Crosswind Church, churches in our area, the capital C church in general, for us to begin focusing on the rules and not the people. I listened to a podcast recently, uh, Rick Warren out of uh, uh, Saddleback Church out of uh, California, and and whoever the interview person was, it was like, how do you, you know, this massive church that's grown out there and doing great things, and and he was like, so how do you grow a great church? He was like, his his answer was really simple. He was like, focus on the people suffering. If you'll help those who need help, you'll grow a church. 
you'll grow a community. The gospel will go forth if you focus on those who desperately need help. If you find the suffering, the poor, the crippled, the whatever, you'll grow a church. The gospel will go forth, ministry will go forth, and it'll change the way people see the church. Now, I kind of think, I don't know, I can't really prove this, but just kind of thinking about the story, like maybe the Pharisees planted this guy. Like maybe, again, if they're going to carefully watch Jesus to try to, to try to trap him, to try to try to get him to break some kind of law, then, then maybe he was there. But in spite of that, in spite of their own wicked ways, despite of them trying to trip literally the Son of God up, Jesus still wants to sit with them. And he still wants to eat with them and be with them in community and in conversation. Why? Because the same God who loves the prostitute is the same God who loves the Pharisee. The same God who loved the tax collector was the same God who loved everybody else that walks the streets. The same God who saved me is the same God who saved you and the same God who wants to save someone here who hasn't made that decision yet. Like, that's how it works. There is no special treatment. There is no favoritism. There is a God who loved you so very much that despite how evil and jacked up and messed up this world is, Jesus still came and Jesus still died. But three days later, he rose from the dead. That's what our faith is based entirely on. And so what happens he heals the guy right from him and sends him on the way. And then Jesus, as always, poses another question. Verse 5, he says, he asks them this. If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? Right? Now, quick poll. Need some, need some participation, including those of you online. If, you have, if there's a person on this planet that you love, or if you have a pet that you care for, or maybe you don't have either one of those, but you have some type of possession that you enjoy or that you have in your ownership. Will you please just raise your hands? Let me see if I'm who I'm talking to this morning. Okay, for those of you who don't like raising your hands in church, that should have been everybody right there because like most people have got one of those three, okay? So here's what I love about this question that Jesus asked, right? And there's some, there's some manuscript issues right here. One, one manuscript says child, another one says donkey, what, ox. Like regardless, whatever you got on planet Earth, whether it's a loved one, whether it's a pet, whether it's some type of possession, if one of those three things, if all three of those things need something, they need help, they need assistance, they need rescuing, they need fixing, they need something, what are you going to do about it? Oh, let me think about it. It's a bad time, really. It's just, not a, it's just the wrong day. right? Let me call the pastor. Or the, the, the one in the church, the one we use all the time. Let me pray about it, right? We always pray about something, right? Like we always want to pray about something. No, you don't do that. If someone you love needs helping, you help. If they need assistance, you assist, you rescue, you fix, you do whatever it is that you have to do. Why? Because there is a love there. There is a care there, that you, so much so that you would do whatever it takes to rescue to assist, to help. I think what Jesus is trying to say here is, look, guys, I understand the Sabbath day. Jesus, if you back up into chapter 13 of Luke, like he actually calls these guys out. He actually says, you hypocrites. He's like, you know good and well if a donkey fell in a hole, you pick the donkey up. Even, he even goes back and says this, more of, more of a kind of a famous line of Jesus. He says that, that man was not created for the Sabbath. In other words, God didn't say, you know what, we need some people resting. Poof, human, right? No, that's not how it worked. He created mankind. He created humanity and rested immediately after. Saw that all of his things that he had created was good. Giving us this incredible example. And what these Pharisees and what religious leaders and what took place after enjoying the law, after understanding what the law was there for, these guys who were experts in the law had been so far removed from that place of salvation, from that place of mercy, from that place of grace, from that place of compassion. They refused to give it out. And what happens is whenever we do that as a church, whenever we get so far past where we came from, 
Whenever we get so far past that place where we once were really, really big sinners, or that pla- past that place of being the tax collector or the prostitute or the self-righteous or whatever you think of your past, once we get so far past that, it's so difficult to dish that same thing out. Isn't it difficult? Many times we think of the rules and the religious activity of church supersedes the people outside these doors. That is the complete opposite of welcoming that I see in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In verse 6, Luke records the response to Jesus' question. It's real simple. And they had nothing to say. Was it because that Jesus called them out? Maybe. Was it because they had tried to trip him up and expose the Son of God for something that he wasn't? Perhaps. Was it because that the Son of God literally in one of their homes was sitting there enjoying community eating and drinking together, having a conversation, healing someone in their very presence. Could it be because they, that Jesus Christ loved the Pharisee just like they lo- that he loved the prostitute woman that we talked about last week? Just like he loved the tax collector that we talked about two weeks ago? Could it be that he loves whomever Regardless of your background, regardless of how far, how long ago it was since you got saved, let me remind you that Jesus still loves you. That he loves you so very much. Perhaps it was all the above. Perhaps he told them this story. Perhaps he asked these questions because he did love them so very much. Regardless of how much they studied studied. The, the Torah, the Old Testament, regardless of how, how, uh, how many uh, 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 Bible verses that they knew, regardless of how many things that they could talk about and show all the religious, regardless of all those things, Jesus was still trying to get to the point that rules should never supersede the people. And unfortunately, what these religious folks had done is just that being experts in the law, knowing the ins and outs of the Mosaic law and the temple system and all the things, right? They'd become so focused. Matter of fact, they'd become so obsessed with these things that simple things like compassion and mercy and grace had simply had to be moved to the back seat. Isn't it terrible that when you think about religion, that oftentimes religion is thought of as the place that humanity goes to die? Because oftentimes when you think about religion, whether it's Christianity or some other kind, oftentimes the priority of humanity is lost. And there's a focus on actions and behaviors and things that you recite, and knowledge that you know. That again, the priority of human beings, the priority of mankind being made in the image of God. Go back and read the creation story. God says, let us make man in our image. Humanity is made in the image of God, right? The imago Dei, the image of the creator God. And you want to put rules over people? You want to focus on your religious activity, right? A lot of times as Christians, we prod ourselves and we, and we pat ourselves on the back about how wonderful it is that we showed up to church today. I mean, I'm glad you guys are here because it would be weird talking to a bunch of empty seats. But like, eventually we have to check ourselves. That Yes, it's good to do the Christian things, right? And coming to church is great and singing worship songs is great. 
And posting Bible verses and sharing things on social media is great. And having the Christian t-shirts and being in a home group. All these things are great. But when the rules oversee the very needs that you're going to interact with and encounter this coming week. I think we need to check ourselves. And think about how when Jesus showed up in people's lives, he redefined the word welcome. If there's one thing I want you to remember today, if there's one thing that I want you to take home, uh, maybe even for those of you in home groups, you're going to talk about this in home groups, is this statement right here. That if, if, if we're going to get this Christianity thing right, right, we can't get it right until we get, let me back up and actually look at what I'm trying to say. We cannot get Christianity right if we get love wrong. That's so powerful, I couldn't even say it unless I looked at it. There are people, perhaps even in this room, who have not yet decided to follow Jesus because some of us are so focused on rules and regulations, and religious activity, that that's boring people into following Jesus. Because the way that you act here is not the way you act out there. And so what if, what if this week, instead of focusing on the Christian things to do, right, because again, I'm not saying those things are bad, those things are wonderful and good, and yes, next steps and small disciplines, Absolutely, yes, you should read your Bible. Yes, you should pray. But sometimes we get so focused on that that the coworker that desperately needs to be encouraged or the coworker that desperately needs to be invited to your small group or to your church just to experience the same freedom that you've experienced never gets an invite. If we were to take away all of our religious activity this past week, right? I don't want to know about your Bible reading. I don't want to know about your prayer life. I don't want to know of how many scriptures you shared on social media. I don't want to know any of that mess. What I want to know is this question. Who did you love? Who did you love like Jesus loved? Who did you treat like Jesus would have treated them? Who did you care for? Whose needs did you put above your own? Let's talk about that question. Let's talk about redefining the word welcoming. Because that's what people need. I think it's great that you have the entire book of Matthew memorized. Kudos. Like, wonderful. But like, there are people that desperately need to be shown grace and mercy and compassion this week. They don't need your scripture. Use your scripture to build your own faith, absolutely. But when encountering people outside these four walls who desperately know the love of Jesus Christ, show them that love in a real and tangible way. Who is it this week that could just love on somebody like Jesus would love on somebody? Right? What would it look like when you go to the restaurant today to tip big? What would it look like to be a group of believers that when people looked at us, they're like, you know what, I don't know if I believe all the things that they believe, and I'm not really sure about the Bible, but they're different. And I don't know if I believe that or if I think I, I, think I want to be a part of that, but I like them. They're generous, and they're caring, and they're patient, and they love me. They don't agree with my lifestyle, but they love me, and they actually, I feel like they genuinely care about me. I wonder if that's what that Jesus was all about. I wonder if the God that they serve and they worship and they sing about, I wonder if that's what he's like. And the way they live and the way they act and the way they behave is a direct reflection of that God. What would it be like if we just decided, you know what, this week for the next seven days, I'm just going to try to love better. Right? That if Jesus can sit down with the worst of worst in society, as well as on the other side of that, if he can go to, to visit the most self-righteous religious person and anybody in between those two spectrums, like if Jesus could do that and love them well, why can't I? So think about it. 
this week, my encouragement for every single person in the room, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you can just sit back and judge us and see if we do this really well or not. But like, especially for those of you Christians, like we've got to work on this. Because eventually, in a couple weeks, Easter's coming. And most of the time, we talk about inviting folks to, to, to Easter services. And you know what I find really hard about inviting someone to, to an Easter Sunday service? It's really hard to invite someone when, whenever you've insulted them beforehand. It's really difficult to inspire someone to follow Jesus when you've insulted them. Right? And a lot of times, we, we Christians, we insult people with the word of God. And look, I understand there's a corrective measure, but first off, there needs to be love. And there needs to be grace, and there needs to be mercy, and there needs to be compassion. And so when there comes a point when the Holy Spirit is working in and amongst people, then he will institute the change, not you. You have a job, it's to love. Focus on your job. What if this week, again, what if this week, just for seven days, we didn't focus on just those religious things that we do? Just the activity that we inspire and we talk about and you go to church and all the kind of stuff, all the stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about? All the Christian stuff. Like, what would it just look like to love on people? Like, you had one job. To love on people. Would that inspire somebody to follow Jesus? Maybe. Would it inspire someone to come to your church or a church? Maybe. Maybe. What would it look like this week, parents, if we just loved on our kids better? Right? Families, what would it look like if we just loved on each other better? Right? We talk about loving other people, but it's really hard to love on other people when you don't love one another. Could this be the way that we redefine the word welcome? It's not on all the rules and the routines and the regulations of religion but simply on figuring out how to love our neighbors better. I think this could be a start. Matter of fact, I think it's so much so. Um, my oldest daughter, Blakely, she's six years old. She's, uh, she's in kindergarten, and um, over the last, I don't know, month or so, um, on the mornings that I take her to school, I've been asking her um, uh, just a simple question as we kind of get in the, the car line or drop-off line, whatever it's called. Um, I've just been asking her this question. All right, what are we going to do today? I say we, but it's mainly her. But, like, you know, like, what are we going to do today? And she'll go spouting off all these answers, right? Any six-year-old brain is going to do, right? And so, like, you, you want to be on the color purple, right? Like you want to be, that's, like, the best color, apparently, right? Like, you got to be on the color purple, and apparently they give tickets, and you got to get a tornado ticket, and... Uh, then she'll go on and she'll talk about uh, be respectful and show kindness, right? Like kind of bragging on my kid a little bit. But anyway, like she's, she's talking about all these things. She just spouts off all these things. They talked about compassion last month and cross with kids and be kind and listen to teachers and all that. You know what I don't tell her to do? Mainly because she's got all the right answers. But like, do you know one of the things I don't tell her to do? Hey, do you know the Ten Commandments? Hey, Blakely, do you know the Ten Commandments? Before you get out of school, I need you to know the Ten Commandments. Blakely, do you know what John 3.16 says? Blakely, hey, Blake, focus, like, you know, six-year-old, focus, right? Like, I don't care if she knows that stuff. She's six years old. Now, for the super spiritual Christians in the room that I just offended, let me say this. Jesus tells us to love God with everything within us and love our neighbor. And I could care less if my six-year-old knows any of the Ten Commandments. What I do care is that when she walks into her school, when she walks into her classroom, and she walks down the hallway, wherever she goes in her classroom, I do care that she's respectful and she's kind and compassionate because eventually there's going to come a day where that foundation of character, where that foundation of traits, of just simple, just great humanity, there's going to come a day where she's going to have a conversation with me, her mom, Miss Courtney, Miss Casey, another small group leader, somebody, and she's going to want to know why we do these things. And it's going to be because we believe life with Jesus is better, not because we should follow some rules. It's about following Jesus because life with him is so much better. 
And we can act this way because he acted this way. And he treated people this way. And even before she's even made that decision, she can be kind. And that's why for those of you who aren't following Jesus yet because you're still maybe on the fence or maybe some Christian offended you and you're not real sure about this whole thing, I understand that and I get that. But for a moment, we can all be kind. And we all can be compassionate and give mercy and give grace and give all those things where they're needed. But the tipping point is not just to do these things because we want to be good humans. The point is we have a God who loved us first. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because our God is love, it's not something he does, it's something he is. Because our God is love, we can love other people. And that means people that don't look like you. Oh, here he goes. They don't act like you. And they don't dress like you. And they don't have the money like you do. They don't drive the cars like you do. They don't vote like you. Right? You want to redefine welcome in your job, in your family, in your school, at your university, wherever it is. It's not with the masses. It's with the individual. And it's loving them well. And so this week, my plea, my prayer, my hope for every single person in the room, especially if you're a Christian, gosh, if you want to get Christianity right, we've got to figure out this love thing. And not just the people that you like and that you love, but all those people around us. Because the same God that loves you and the same God that went to the cross for you and came up out of the grave for you is the exact same God that loves everybody else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. God, as always, thank you for your word. May it always challenge us, change us, and convict us. And Father, this morning I pray, especially for those of us who are Christians, you know, for those of us who are following Jesus, we're doing the very best that we can do. And sometimes we can get so wrapped up in life and routine and kids and school and all the things and we forget to simply love well. And that's what you did. Like, that's what you did the best is you loved everybody well. And I know there's going to be some things this week. I know there's going to be some situations this coming week, God, that we're not going to agree with. We're going to disagree with. We're going to have problems with other people, whether that be at work, whether that be politically, whether it be in a, another kind of relationship. God, and through all that mess, Lord, help us to love well. Lord, I'm so thankful for spiritual disciplines like reading your word and all those things. But God, above all things, help us to love other people extremely well. God, I pray for the folks in the room who haven't made that decision to follow you yet. I pray that because maybe we as a community, we as Crosswind Church, would begin to love well other people, those in the room, those in the community, those at our jobs, those in our schools, the people around us who have not yet decided to follow you would take notice. And they would notice that we love well and that we love always. God, help us. Holy Spirit, work in the lives of people who have not yet to make that decision. God, put them in paths of people who can show them love, who can treat them right. And so that one day, whether it be in today in the starting point room, whether it's in a home group, whether they call up their Christian mama, they would come to a decision to following you. And may we celebrate that decision. May we celebrate everybody's decision to follow you. Lord, I thank you for all the amazing things you're doing in and through Crosswind Church. Continue to use us out and about in our community to show others that life with you is so very much better. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody at Crosswind Church said, amen. amen. You guys have an incredible, incredible week.